better stand. Understanding medicine. Professor Aziz Rahman here with another lecture on simple topic which we encounter every day and this is basically an approach to a very common symptom like dyspepsia or epigastric pain. So both terms might look similar. They are actually similar but when we go into the details the depth of the definition they are different and they have different differential diagnosis. So in this presentation I am going to demonstrate how to differentiate between the two and how to develop the differential diagnosis and of course final treatment will be based on the final diagnosis which might require further tests. So what is dyspepsia? It's actually any discomfort in upper abdomen which is called epigastrium. So any kind of discomfort which is short of actual pain. Patient described it like heaviness, burning, some bloating, kind that kind of word but it's not true pain. Some, some patient might uh, describe it as pain also but uh, mostly it is something less than pain, some discomfort but not actually pain in the upper abdomen and it is typically related to me. Patient would complain of having this symptom typically after having a relatively heavy meal and presumably arising from stomach or the duodenum. So this is dyspepsia. It's a very vague term but we understand what actually it means and what is the differential diagnosis. And similar terms which are used for same problem could be burning, could be acidity, could be heartburn and bloating and fullness and finally uh, I think these are the symptoms which one can uh, describe. Sometime patient may use different words but sometimes he would or she would say just one word. So any vague discomfort in the upper abdomen which is related to me which is short of pain will be called dyspepsia. As against dyspepsia epigastric pain is actually pain. So pain which arises in the upper abdomen this part this part which is epigastrium upper portion of the abdomen and it has specific differential diagnosis because of its location. Now you could have many problems in the abdomen but other like for example cystitis would not cause epigastric pain. So those viscera which are situated in the upper abdomen they may cause epigastric pain but most likely this pain is maybe because of the pancreas or maybe gallbladder. So I think this is the fundamental difference between dyspepsia and epigastric pain both may be related to eating both are in the epigastric region but dyspepsia is some kind of discomfort but epigastric pain is actual pain and this actual pain may be mild or may be moderate or may be severe may be sudden in onset or may be chronic and that we will discuss in further slides. So in dyspepsia of course uh, the evaluation includes history, physical examination and investigation and you all know that maximum information comes from a good history. History has very very reassuring and healing effect also. Patient listening to the patient is actually key to the success. So careful history is very important and what are the points which are you going to ask? Uh, how long? Of course short duration dyspepsia would have different differential diagnosis. Somebody having symptom for very very long but still maintaining general good health that would mean something benign. Relationship to meals. Some dyspepsias, most dyspepsias actually are they increase after having meal but some may actually get better after meal. Reflux symptoms and uh, this is very typical symptom of GERD or GERD or whatever you want to call it gastroesophageal reflux disease. Patient feels as if food contents or acid 
regurgitates back into the esophagus and that is also a symptom which could be related to dyspepsia. Associated symptom, uh, bloating or pain going to the back and sweating, this may be very important. For, for example, patient with ischemic heart disease can also present as dyspepsia and patient want to believe that this is actually dyspepsia, not heart problem. In, a patient may be in a state of self-denial. Patient would emphasize that he feels better when he belches out or when he takes some antacids, but you have to concentrate on symptoms other than epigastric discomfort or dyspepsia like radiation, like any shortness of breath and pain going to other areas, sweating, so they might suggest possibility of ischemic heart disease. Weight loss, uh, normally little bit of dyspepsia should not cause any weight loss. If there is significant documented weight loss, this might point toward a nasty condition, especially if the patient is little elderly. I think these patients uh, with dyspepsia and weight loss must be investigated. There is a possibility of malignancy. Hematemesis, if somebody spits up blood, I think that of course typically indicates that there is some ulceration in the esophagus, stomach or duodenum or melina, the even more severe uh, symptom of uh, bleeding. So melina is passage of dark and tarry stool per ectum. So that means that there was bleeding in the stomach or the duodenum uh, anywhere above the ligament of teeth. So that blood is converted into black uh, substance and that is passed in the stool. Now please remember, you need to have fairly large amount of bleeding to have melina. So presence of melina would not only indicate that there is a problem in the stomach, it would indicate that the problem is severe and serious. So these are the symptoms you are going to highlight when you encounter a patient with dyspepsia. Then let's take up physical examination. In physical examination, you would examine the epigastrium and if there is tenderness, uh, of course, that would indicate the presence of inflammation underneath. It could be gastritis, it may be pancreatitis, cholecystitis, hepatitis. So pain, uh, epig the tenderness is an important sign. Presence of pallor, that might suggest chronic GA bleeding. If you feel mass, it may be in the stomach or it may be in the, uh, in the liver or in the retroperitoneal tissue. So feeling of mass or it could be an aneurysm, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, koilonychia. Koilonychia is spoon-shaped nails and this is a very typical sign of chronic iron deficiency state. So if somebody with epigastric discomfort has got koilonychia, that might suggest chronic worm infestation or peptic ulcer disease. Then supraclavical nodes, uh, stomach malignancy, they sometimes metastasize to the supraclavical lymph node. So if somebody has their supraclavical node enlarged, that means that could indicate uh, stomach cancer. So I think after history, if you examine the patient carefully, you would be reasonably sure what exactly are you dealing with. But in some cases, investigation would be necessary. Now, in investigation, uh, I think we always include CBC. It's a basic test and this might give you clue. Patient having hypochromic microcytic anemia would indicate chronic uh, blood loss from the stomach. Abdominal ultrasound and other imaging tests very, very good test. It will tell you uh, abdominal ultrasound may not be great to find out any stomach related problem. Of course, if there is a big tumor with uh, stomach that will also be picked up on ultrasound. But ultrasound is basically to rule out other organ related problem, gallbladder, liver and spleen and other structures. And stool examination, uh, stool complete examination might show the presence of worms or occult blood. So I think that is important. H. pylori investigation. Uh, that might not be needed in every patient. If you have made the diagnosis of acid peptic disease, then H. pylori eradication, H. pylori investigation may be necessary. And I will have a separate lecture because this uh, the number of investigation 
I want to describe them in detail, so I would have a separate lecture on how to investigate H. pylori infection and how to treat it. Upper GA endoscopy, of course, this is perhaps the final test to evaluate dyspepsia, but it is usually not done as a first line of investigation. Although it is safe, but it is expensive and it may be uh, not it may not be available everywhere and it may be little invasive uh, and I think for all reasons it is usually kept at the end if these things do not give you a definitive diagnosis then upper G endoscopy must be done and this must be done if there is even slightest suspicion of malignancy because malignancy can only be definitely diagnosed on endoscopy and it also provides the opportunity of taking biopsy. A differential diagnosis of dyspepsia may be within the GIT tract or may be out of the GIT tract. Now within the GIT tract it basically means it is a kind of acid peptic disease, simple gastritis, inflammation of uh, the stomach mucosa or gastric erosions. That means small superficial usually multiple ulcers which result as a, uh, due to some medication or corrosive intake, gastric ulcer, duodenal ulcer, non-ulcer dyspepsia, functional dyspepsia. Many patients they have very typical dyspeptic symptom and they feel better after taking antacids and or taking some other drug for uh, acid peptic disease but you don't see any ulcer or even inflammation and this is called non-ulcer dyspepsia and this may be there may be some functional uh, etiology behind this then non stomach disease like a stomach heart disease i think that will take us to this side chronic pancreatitis cholecystitis again chronic because acute cholelithiasis cholecystitis would cause severe pain that i think i would classify as epigastric pain non alcoholic fatty liver disease or alcoholic fatty liver disease that also may cause mild discomfort. Then ischemic heart disease that is something we do not want to miss ever because it could have very serious implication particularly in women particularly when there is inferior wall ischemia. So there could be dyspepsia or pain or discomfort referred to the epigastrium or felt in the epigastrium. So on detailed questioning you will have the suspicion of ischemic heart disease. Patient says this symptom comes on exertion or uh, uh, there is some sweating. In any case, in elderly people, I think you need to keep ischemic heart disease in the differential diagnosis. Then other, of course, there are many other conditions which can be considered, but to keep the list short, I'm not going to discuss them. Uh, the treatment, uh, we are taking dyspepsia as a symptom. So here we are going to discuss the symptomatic treatment. After the diagnosis is made, then of course the actual treatment or the definitive treatment will be offered. Antacids, antacids are substances which are basically alkalis. Now the first generation antacid was sodium bicarbonate, which is actually still available and very effective. But if you consume large quantity of sodium bicarbonate, it may be absorbed and may cause systemic alkalosis. So that is usually not used, but other uh, salt like aluminum uh, or, or magnesium uh, based uh, antacids, they are non-systemic. They will neutralize stomach acid and will provide immediate relief. So antacids these days are not used as a primary treatment of uh, peptic ulcer disease because it's fairly bulky and you have to consume many times a day but still if somebody is on treatment and despite that somebody develops dyspepsia or somebody develops dyspepsia only occasionally I think antacids may be a good choice one to two tablespoon consumed I think should give you immediate at least partial relief of dyspepsia then H2 blockers are very very effective drugs they block uh, the H2 receptors of parietal cells and I will discuss this in more detail when we discuss acid peptic disease. But these are fairly effective drugs and they, they can reduce your stomach uh, acid production and provides long term relief. And it would also 
promote ulcer healing. Even more potent are proton pump inhibitors. Omeprazole, this is like example, femotidine, sametidine, and this is omeprazole, esomeprazole, ribiprazole, and other. And this will also be discussed in more detail in acid peptide disease. So depending upon the severity and the duration, you could use any of them. Then some patient might not get relief with this. I think we have to give spasmolytic. Now, spasm could be because of another organ involved like gallbladder, but even stomach pain, when there is acidity, I think there may be some spasm of pyloric muscles and that may also contribute to pain. So I've seen if you combine spasmolytic, uh, usually oral, with antacids, they provide immediate relief. Uh, if there is immediate relief, that would be another point in favor of the problem being related to stomach. But please keep your suspicion of ischemic heart disease high if there is a patient who is in that age group and has got uh, the, the risk factors also. Further treatment would be based on the actual cause. So maybe after history, physical examination and investigation, we would know exactly the cause and then further treatment would be discussed in subsequent lectures. Now about epigastric pain, uh, any pain in the epigastric region, which is actual pain, not just little discomfort, and it could be mild, moderate or severe, depending upon the etiology. For example, the pain of pancreatitis is very, very severe. Patient usually asks for injectable and even injectables are usually not sufficient to relieve his pain. We have to give multiple narcotic based analgesic. Similarly, pain of gallbladder, the biliary colic is also usually very severe. So I think they, the, the severity of pain and that should give you some clue to the diagnosis. If, if it is in the upper abdomen or central abdomen or it is on the right or left, I think that should also give you the clue. Uh, colicky or fixed. So this pain could be colicky like in biliary colic or fixed like in pancreatitis. Presumably arising from stomach, liver, gallbladder, pancreas or other. So epigastric pain arises from any of these organs usually sudden in onset okay so this is epigastric pain now you you can tell the difference between epigastric pain and dyspepsia based on what i described although the differential diagnosis is overlapping again you will use the three modalities the history physical examination and investigation in history you would ask how long this pain has been there severity mild moderate or severe or is it the, the nature of pain is it like burning or is it nagging or colicky and origin and radiation now sometimes pain starts in the epigastrium and radiates to the back sometimes pain starts the right hypochondrium and radiates to the back so these kind of description will give you the clue now remember pain of biliary colic always starts in the epigastric region uh, because gallbladder itself is situated in the right hypochondrium many young physicians they miss epigastric pain arising from biliary colic uh, because the pain is central they think if it is central it is probably stomach related so this is my point which i like to emphasize that the the pain which arises from the gallbladder is usually in the epigastrium first and only after gallbladder is inflamed only then pain and tenderness is localized to the right hypochondria is, is there any vomiting or aversion to food vomiting and aversion to food both would be uh, symptoms related to epigastric pain jaundice of course that would be highly suggestive of biliary tract disease or pancreas fever so and hematemesis. So these are the points. I think anybody uh, dealing with the case of epigastric pain would ask these questions. And if you ask them carefully, and they give you very definite clue to the possible to the diagnosis. Then comes physical examination. In physical examination, epigastric tenderness or right hypochondrial tenderness if liver is palpable or tender so that would be very important clue 
if there is any mass now you have to be familiar with the normal feeling uh, uh, normally there is no mass in the epigastrium uh, liver is also just barely palpable spleen is normally not palpable so if you can definitely feel something some solid structure that is an abnormality then guarding of abdominal muscles that would indicate the presence of peritonitis guarding is that muscles are very very rigid and when you press uh, you don't feel the normal uh, feeling of the stomach wall uh, the abdominal wall it is very very rigid so i think that would indicate underlying peritonitis jaundice uh, you examine the patient in daylight and see if there is jaundice you have to have significantly elevated bilirubin to be able to uh, observe jaundice uh, milder jaundice can be missed even by an experienced person i think clue to the diagnosis of jaundice is to ask the patient if there is any discoloration of urine so if the urine is dark that becomes dark urine becomes dark before jaundice appears on conjunctivae or sclera so i think that question is important bowel sounds when you examine and if bowel sounds are exaggerated that might indicate intestinal obstruction or or some other kind of infection even in gastroenteritis you have increased bowel sound and if abdomen is absolutely silent you don't hear even normal bowel sound that might indicate paralytic ileus now after the physical examination then you have to consider investigations in investigation i think cbc should be done because that is a very basic test and then liver function test is important uh, hepatitis would indicate uh, would be indicated by elevation of alt ast and bilirubin amylase and lipase these are great laboratory tests when you suspect pancreatitis but there is caveat amylase is not present in all patient with pancreatitis so is lipase and amylase is excreted very fast so if somebody had just one short episode of pancreatitis and patient may still having may still may be having pain but maybe serum amylase is already normal serum amylase is more sensitive and lipase is more specific so first we do amylase and if it is elevated and then if history is already consistent with pancreatitis then we don't repeat uh, they do we do not do lipase otherwise if there is a suspicion maybe we can do lipase also now there is a condition called macroamylasemia what is that condition in some normal healthy people there is a the amylase is actually big molecule and it is not excreted by the kidney and it accumulates so even if that person does not have pancreatitis serum amylase may be elevated elevated so serum amylase would should be interpreted in the proper perspective if somebody is suspected to be having pancreatitis then elevated amylase would be confirmatory or at least supportive sign abdominal ultrasound in all abdominal uh, condition i think ultrasound is necessary i think in all uh, patient having any kind of abdominal discomfort abdominal ultrasound should be done because a very very cheap and very very non invasive and gives you lot of information so ultrasound should be done x ray abdomen may be needed in some cases ct abdomen may be needed because sometimes we just are unable to determine the cause of epigastric pain on simple investigation CD, ct is better than uh, simple x ray and ct is also better than ultrasound when it comes to resolution and when it comes to picking up smaller issues or hidden issues and upper g endoscopy should also be done if there is no diagnosis after the ct scan Uh, of course we prioritize these investigations sometime we go straight to the upper g endoscopy sometime we go uh, to the x ray so i think that would depend on the basis of our primary suspicion after history and physical examination we would have a reasonable idea what exactly we are dealing with and investigation should be planned accordingly
you know investigation we always should be little conservative because we want to uh, reserve our resources spare our resources and we do not want to subject our patient unnecessarily to invasive tests and the tests which are going to be expensive and not going to give uh, the uh, information differential diagnosis of dyspepsia and epigastric pain together the peptic ulcer disease very common cholelithiasis again common but often missed if somebody comes with epigastric pain which uh, which started suddenly and is severe patient went to the emergency got some treatment and got relieved that patient is usually treated with acid peptic disease uh, medication i think ultrasound should be done in all these patient and you will be surprised that actually the cause was cholelithiasis pancreatitis acute viral hepatitis other liver disorders like liver abscess ischemic heart disease and other so this is the differential diagnosis of dyspepsia and epigastric pain together symptomatic treatment is spasmolytic oral or intravenous depending upon the severity if pain is severe then of course i would give intravenous spasmolytic because oral would take lot long time to start working the patient has severe pain intravenous spasmolytic or sometime non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs are also given and they can also be given orally or intravenously or sometime proton pump inhibitors are also given intravenously so these are the drugs which can be used to relieve patient's symptom and of course after the investigation treatment can be optimized accordingly so final treatment will be according to the final diagnosis thank you very much this this is professor aziz rahman from medstan uh, i hope this video was useful although this uh, was very simple topic but since uh, these topics also have to be covered i thought i will make a video on this one and i look forward to see you in my next video on acid peptic disease thank you